pretty fancy equipment that he's created. And so when the weather warms up a little bit, he has some hot spots, maybe they're cold spots, but they uh, have potentially gold. And, uh, we thought this would be a fantastic outing to have Ray take us out uh, into a site where we probably wouldn't get shot, ideally. We're not claim jumping. We must stay away from those problems. But he knows where the holes are, where publicly you can go and do your mining your and fanning, and it's uh, legal and appropriate. So, um, I, 170. 170 locations. So, 170 places to, to do some gold searching. So, uh, uh, Wade also searches for like things like gold almost. <laughs> Can you tell me your hobby? It's hysterical. <laughs> In order way to find find a way to earn some money to get over to Israel, I uh, live on a golf course, and so I walk the golf course four or five miles, and I pick up fifty to seventy golf balls a, a night, and I sell them online. So I sell. <laughs> Ten to twelve thousand golf balls a year. <laughs> and it, it pays for his ministry trips to Israel. <laughs> Is that awesome? I think that's awesome. <laughs> oh, too funny. So we, where's Callie? Where's Elisa? Where's Debbie? And hello. I hear Debbie's voice. They're both up. They're both up. There you are. I I hear a voice. I hear She's the next to Nancy or me or whatever. <laughs> Is Callie with you? Yeah, she'll be right there. So we have one last announcement. I'll just wait for her. But anyway, I uh, didn't have everyone here. So this is Callie. Callie, I just had one announcement left about the party. Debbie, that party next week, yes. we're going to cancel the ugly sweater part. No, we are. Come on. No, we're not. Sorry. Okay, you guys, can we make a vote real quick? Ugly sweaters or no ugly sweaters? Who would say no ugly sweaters? <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. Oh. Let me tell you why. Let, 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 let me tell you why. This is important. I picked up the ugliest sweater yesterday made by man. In the competition, there will be none. I will That's win. not true. Oh, I'm yeah. pretty darn ugly one. No idea, young lady. I, 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 I do. I do. Wow. No, I, I, I guess we keep laughing. Right. One question, Debbie, who's the judge of the ugly sweater? I need to talk to them. I guess you. Yes. This is a benevolent dictatorship. <laughs> I'm <laughs> uh, like a Pastor Jay. Jay. Oh, I like that. How's That's that? That's very objective. <laughs> <laughs> and who's the tiebreaker? Mrs. Debbie? Daniel. Daniel? Okay, okay. Are we all good with that? <laughs> Those perspective judges? No, but I'm in it. I'm going to win. 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 i am going to win i am any other announcements from our caller side? And we'll get to a topics where they may get one. Yes, go ahead. Great. Everybody's got to sign this massive card. It's for Sarah and Brendan. Yes. Um, so we're going to pass that around. Please sign. Um, and then somewhere there's a sign-up sheet. I think oh, yes, I have. Uh, yeah, there's a sign-up sheet. We're going to pass that around to you just to bring stuff because a few people can't bring everything. So For this coming Saturday? For this coming Saturday. Fantastic. Thank you, Callie. Pass that around. Yeah. Yeah. We did call Joshua yeah, back from so school, I'm assuming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. good semester? Yeah. Good. You want someone to sit with you? I feel bad. Yeah, Kelly, come over here. This is, we look so lonely. <laughs> no longer lonely now. <laughs> Sorry. All righty. Well, we'll get started here. For the group, uh, they've been uh, in the new members class for about, this is the 10th week, and they get an overview from the different pastors. And I thought I would just share a little bit about the college ministry, and then we'll talk about the Psalms and kind of our, our study format. Um, 
like from a campus viewpoint, I was saved in college in 1979. So uh, it was a secular school. It was actually a religious school at one time that had gone uh, left, very, very liberal, very apostate. So um, in fact, I was later kicked off the campus after I was converted because I was witnessing to witches and, and uh, tree huggers. And the tree huggers were very upset that I was saying Jesus is the way and they called the campus police. And the police escorted a graduate of the school off the campus because I was telling them about Jesus. And that stirred up, I guess, quite a stink. So uh, anyway, so a small college, but I got saved in my junior year. And uh, one of the first events for outreach was I took a bunch of guys down to Washington, D.C. on a basketball tournament. It was a Word of Life basketball tournament where they had a uh, Bill Rice or Pete Rice preaching uh, an evangelistic message at the middle part of the day in the, in the competition. And I took uh, our number one basketball player from E-Town, one of the you know, all-American kind of guys. His name was Bogey from uh, Pittsburgh, Leon Carswell. And uh, I couldn't get cornbread to come. Cornbread was probably too high to go. Um, we had a rough bunch of guys, but great ball players. And... Um, Several of them got saved that day. It was really neat. So it just, it just fueled my interest in doing sports outreaches. And then uh, I began to work with my, my classmates, the baseball players, and had the joy of leading about half of the team to the Lord. So we, we went from a very pagan team to uh, kind of a traveling evangelistic baseball team. And then from there, um, the Lord called me to preach. And um, in college, in seminary, Elisa and I got married. We were praying... Um, you know, what would be the Lord's assignment for us? And we were very interested in going to a college town and uh, starting a church. That was kind of, we wanted to pioneer, we wanted to innovate. And we wanted to go back to Pennsylvania. We were at Bob Jones down in, in Greenville. And we, the South had a church on every corner. And we just wanted to go back to the Yankee land and go somewhere where there wasn't a church and start it. So we were looking at a couple places. Uh, one was Bucknell University, very really pleasant town. Uh, division Division II uh, college area, and then I always liked Happy Valley. Uh, I was a big Penn State fan and um, a Nittany Lion guy, and uh, so we had, we were starting to just kind of explore college towns to start a church, and uh, we were praying that the Lord would make it clear where to go before I finished that that semester. And as we were praying, uh, I got a call from Al Robinson from Clemson, a University Baptist church. And he said, we got your name uh, from the director of ministerial students, uh, Dr. Rob. And um, we heard that you were saved in college and might be a good fit for a college town church. Would you come up and preach for, for us? So I did. And in fact, the sermon I preached, the first message at UBC I'm preaching this morning here uh, at, at Tri-City is the genealogy of Matthew chapter one. Um, we went up there. We loved the people. They loved us from day one. Um, we took one week off, and they, they invited me back for five weeks. And after that, um, uh, on Easter, April 7th, my birthday, I became the pastor there at UBC. And in uh, 1986, we started uh, what was going to be called the Spurgeon Foundation Campus Ministries for Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the Baptist preacher, 1800s. The problem was the students couldn't connect with the name Spurgeon Foundation. So we had outdoorsmen coming out thinking it was a fishing club, Sturgeon. Uh, we, had, we had business guys coming out thinking it was a business foundation of some sort. We had medical students coming out thinking it was a surgeon convention. It was just, we had, a, we had a, a, an identity crisis. So eventually uh, we would start that ministry. It would go gangbusters there at Clemson. Uh, we began to be asked to help other churches start campus ministries. <clears throat> During that time, I felt that we needed to write a curriculum for campus ministry, college age ministry. And uh, I realized in our seminaries, they had children's ministries and, as part of the training in high school and you know, youth ministries. And then they went to adult ministries, but never did that interim campus college stage of life. And so I, I put together a curriculum, which would later become a book, Taking the Cross of Christ to Campus, and went around the seminaries and colleges making an appeal. Hey, what about adding this curriculum to, your, to, to the training of the seminary and Bible students? And uh, pretty much most of the schools in the, in the Southeast, I was able to help either install that program or give that emphasis and uh, help in those areas. Uh, the schools I really dove into was Northland and, and at, at Bob Jones. And so what happened from there uh, with the identity crisis, we would change our, our college ministry to uh, cross impact ministries. So we went from dispersion to cross impact. 
Uh, that decision was made on the 18th hole of the Clemson golf course there um, at, the, at, the, at the convention center. We, a group of guys met and brainstormed. And we thought that was a much better name. And we publicly announced that at our conference at Fourth Baptist in Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. And so from the early 2000s, the ministry name was Cross Impact. We then um, went and uh, filled out all the forms to be a 501c3 separate mission agency, which we are and still are, and began to, to, to do other charters around the country. And so we've had a, a real interest in, in college ministries. Uh, we were excited uh, just this past week uh, Stephen White, who's coming up to be our youth pastor, has a friend who's doing a Bible study in uh, Tucson, Arizona, at a Bible at a college, not Bible college, but a secular college, and uh, very good friends. And uh, that friend is saying, "Hey, we'd like to work with Cross Impact. How do we get one started?" Um, the Mines were not officially chartered there, but we're we're there doing Bible study. We're at the Aurora campus now, and we're doing Bible study on Tuesdays. And uh, I really would like to see us get it get on CU in the near future. And uh, they have a new football coach, Neon Dion, primetime. Um, and he's, he's a spark plug. Who knows what he'll do for that program? He may, he may light it up. Who knows? Uh, he's the only guy in human history to ever play baseball in a World Series game and football in a Super Bowl game. Wow. So he has some very unique credentials. And I remember watching before you were born um, <laughs> destroy Clemson. We were beating Florida State where he was a student athlete. We had them. We had them pinned down, and our coach um, chose to kick, a, chose to punt to him, and he ran it back 65, 70 yards, just, just, just rocket speed, and just got them right back in the game. And then we, we, we would do whatever, and then we held them. All we had to do was hold them, get the ball, run the clock out. And uh, that's when uh, Bobby Bowden pulled off the famous Puntruski, one of the greatest plays in, in college history. They, it's, it's ranked in the top 10 plays. And uh, they had the ball around the 20-ish. Florida State went into punt formation, and the Puntruski was unfolded, which ended up being about a about a 70-yard run. And, uh, wow. and through it, they, they would just eke out a victory over us in Death Valley. It was a devastating loss. But Neon Sanders, was he was at the heart of that victory, man. He was the heart and soul of that team. So uh, we'd like to get on the campus. So just a little bit of history, a little bit of where we are, and we, we'd like to do more of the colleges. And um, you know, I think for our college career class, you are in such a unique spot to pray for it, to be a part of it. And uh, some of you already are, so we're encouraged. Okay, uh, any comments, questions on campus ministry? And we'll change gears, grind gears, and get into our Psalms uh, devotional here for this morning. Any comments, questions, college ministry? Okay, so what we're doing for our guests in this room, uh, we do a, we read one psalm a day or one chapter of the Bible a day. Right now we're working for the psalms. Uh, we take Sunday off from reading a new chapter. So we basically each week read six chapters. Uh, by doing that, we can go through the Bible uh, you know, once every four years. Um, each semester, the notebooks are available for those who like to have hard copies. They'll be available digitally as well. And we just do chapter by chapter by chapter through the semester. So uh, this semester we've been working through the Psalms, and uh, we're on Psalm 79. So that means we've covered 78 Psalms so far. So let me just highlight a couple things. And uh, what our format often is is up. I want to make sure I give a few key teaching points, but we also want to share you know what things we're learning in our own reading and any questions we might have. <clears throat> So if you have your Bibles, we'll just start here in uh, Psalm 79, and uh, you're going to see in the title above the first verse, and some of your Bibles, you might see a Psalm of Asaph. So these are not Davidic authored Psalms, the Holy Spirit authored through uh, Asaph, and in Psalm 79, as you begin reading it, it's very clear the context. So I'll just start, and you tell me what time in Israel's history this is describing. O oh God, the heathen are come into thine inheritance. The holy temple hath they defiled. They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. The dead bodies of thy servants have they given to be meat under the fowls of the heaven, the flesh of thy saints, under the beasts of the earth. Their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem, and there was none to bury them. So what time period are we are we talking about here? 70 AD? General Titus? No. 
Although it's the same description, it's true, but no. That could be in revolt. Uh, there was some of that there too, but no, not yet. <clears throat> go back further. Yeah, go back further. So this is describing the fall of Jerusalem 586. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's giving you details you don't get from some of the other passages, the prophets like Ezekiel and uh, Jeremiah. So it, it's describing the destruction of the city, the temple, the enormous loss of life and, and people are being you know, killed, people are being taken in, in the exiles, prisoners of war. And what you have is you know, no one even there to bury the dead. There's just so many dead. And for a Jew, you have to bury your dead by the end of the day before sunset. So this is, this is ceremonially very defiling for them. And of course, what's happening is the, the author here is, is seeing God's wrath being poured out upon Israel through human instrumentation, the Babylonians. And the questions raised, verse 5, how long? And how long is this going to continue, Lord? You know, you're obviously jealous over your people. You're jealous over us as your children, especially when we veer away and love other idols. And so uh, how long is this going to continue? When will you be propitiated? Big word, propitiated. When, when will your wrath be satisfied? When will your wrath be propitiated? And so good questions are being asked. And then there's a plea, and this is a good one. Verse 8, oh, remember not against us former iniquities. Let thy tender mercies speedily prevent or precede us. We're brought very low. So aren't you glad if you've asked the Lord to save you that your sins have been forgiven and they're not going to be brought back up? They're not going to be remembered. They're not going to be you know, put out in front of everyone to observe, highlighted. So uh, that's a powerful passage. Uh, I just finished a book actually uh, yesterday uh, for my family, and I'll make it available for anyone who'd like to purchase a copy here. But it's, uh, it's called Don't Let Your Bananas Get Black. <laughs> and it's the story of my grandmother. So uh, I'm a mama's boy and a grandmother's boy. And uh, the storyline basically is my, my step-grandmother, Chips, as we called her. Um, she was uh, in the <clears throat> 20s a flapper. She was a flapper. What's a flapper? <laughs> Roaring 20s. What's a flapper? A bird. <laughs> she was a bird. Not that. <laughs> What's a flapper? A dancer, dancers. A dancer, very risque, mm -hmm. wild, party women. This was the this was the jet set of the twenties. No morals, no scruples, just drink, party for ladies to smoke cigarettes. You know they that didn't have right yet to vote, so they're pushing. Can you imagine for a lady to vote? And uh, they were just the, the screaming liberals of the day, and she was one of those. She was one of those, and she uh, met a a a guy like Steven Spielberg. She met a director. At that time, there was 20 different movie uh, companies, uh, in cinemas. And uh, this was the time where the movies were going, imagine this, going from just action to, to talkies. You know what a talkie is? This is big time. They actually could, you had voice, you had sound. So the movies went from no talk to talking. So really, really you know, up, upscale type of stuff. So she's in that time period. She's in that time period. She meets this movie director, and they get married. And uh, she, she she gets wined and dined by by this guy, Lacey Johnson. Um, and later, she can't keep pace with him. But he, she'd be introduced to the movie stars of that day. Uh, one she probably swam with. His name was uh, Johnny Weissmuller, which none of you even know who he is. But Johnny Weissmuller was was the original Tarzan. And they just made his movie a talkie where he could you could hear him scream, oh, you know, the, the Tarzan screech, you know. So anyway, she has an interesting background, but the storyline takes you through her life. And um, and when I get saved, I begin writing to her and she writes back. <coughs> and her classic line is, That's nice, dear. That means she doesn't believe it. <laughs> so whenever I went there, oh, that's nice, dear. And uh, the story goes through with her hearing the gospel, and then she's gonna die. And um, I'm going to do her funeral in Philadelphia. And I'm going through the, her Bible. You know, she had this old family Bible. And I, I just was glancing through it. And I ran into Isaiah 35. And it says, my favorite chapter. And then it says, July 26, uh, 1982. Uh, ever, from this day forward, everlastingly forgiven. Oh. Hmm. It was right after we visited her. And she is told us, that's nice, dear. 
Well, she listened, and after we left, she got saved, and she wrote it, okay? And uh, her sins now will never be remembered. So I love this passage here. Remember, you know, not against his former uh, iniquities. Uh, in fact, we, we, we ask for his purging, verse 9. Help us, O oh God, of our salvation for the glory of, of thy name. Deliver us and purge away our sins. So he is so good to forgive us, and uh, we're so thankful for, for this psalm and that, that emphasis and to recognize verse 13 that we really are his sheep. We're his people and we're his sheep, which transitions us to Psalm 80, where it says, Give your O shepherd. So we're the sheep, he's the shepherd. There's kind of a hinge between the Psalms here and the way they're organized. And um, you move into Psalm 80. But let's stop for Psalm 79 for a moment. Did anyone have any questions from our group, especially as you've read through it, or any highlights that you had in your own reading? You just pause for a moment. So it needs some countries destroyed. Lord, how long is this going to continue? Lord, please don't remember our sins. Please forgive us. You're an appeal. You're a shepherd. Don't forget us. Help us. We need to get out of this mess. Okay. Let's go to Psalm 80. And uh, what you have in here is a, 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 a phrase or uh, several lines that are repeated three times. So whenever you get that kind of repetition, it often divides the psalm or the section of scripture nicely, uh, but also tells you what's most important. So if something's emphasized, it's for our benefit. So verse three, turn us again, O God, and cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved. Verse seven, turn us again, O God of hosts, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Verse 19, turn us again, O Lord, God of hosts, cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. So um, it's, a, it's a, obviously an appeal to God to, to revive his people, to get his people to come back to him, to, to live, have the people delivered, and for the people to enjoy the, the smile of God, the grace of God, the joyful countenance of our Lord. So a very, very powerful emphasis there uh, in that repeated phrase. Um, anyone, as you read through this psalm, is there something that may have jumped out to you, a passage? <clears throat> There's a verse in verse 5 that is kind of touching. Thou feedest them with the bread of tears and givest them tears to drink in great measure. So what is that expressing? Is that, what's that mean? Any thoughts? Feeds them with a bread of tears. Have you ever been so broken that you, you just lost all appetite? The only thing you really have in front of you is tears. <laughs> Seems to be your diet. Um, you just tore up. And so uh, it's, it's sharing very much you know, the consequence of sin, the consequence of God's chastening. And there's just a huge appeal, again, very similar to Psalm 79, where he says, Lord, in verse 8, this is the history of Israel. You, you brought us out of Egypt. You brought us in the promised land. You put our roots down. You blessed us in great ways. And um, we know we have sinned, and we just want to get, get back to your favor. Please restore it. And there's an appeal here for God to, to uh, shepherd and to come back to them and to uh, smile once again. So very powerful psalm, Psalm 80. Psalm 80. Okay, Psalm 81. Um, starts off with music, sing aloud unto God our strength, make a joyful noise in the God of Jacob, take a psalm and bring hither the timbrel, the pleasant harp of the psaltery, uh, blow up the trumpet in the new moon and the time appointed on our psalm feast day. So, you know, huge musical entrance to the psalm. And I've shared of our classes for a group here, you know, we, we have, a, I think, a pretty musical class, actually. So we have a number of our folks that play instruments, a number who sing, and I'm hoping that we'll put together a college career, you know, kind of choir slash ensemble slash mini orchestra. Uh, if you were here Friday night helping at the Young and Heart Banquet, it was a fantastic night. And the, and the teens did a beautiful job uh, singing. <clears throat> I enjoyed uh, Rianne and uh, Jennifer Dorsling playing the piano. I think Jennifer about pushed Rianne off. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> playing dueling pianos or something. And uh, 
Man, oh man, did, did anyone see that at the Fort Rehans? I thought she was going to. <clears throat> you know, Jennifer's pushing her in there, playing these things, and they're crisscrossing, and it looked like it was going to get really scary at one point. But they, they stayed on, they wrote it out, went together. So that's always important to finish your piano duets, with both on the piano. So um, we like to see our class use the musical gifts that God's given them. Gives us a little appeal there. Um, verse 10 Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. What imagery comes to your mind when you see that little phrase? Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. What, what pictures come to your mind? Baby birds. I think of baby birds. You know, here's, here's, here's Mama Robin going out and gets the big worm early and comes back to the nest and there's all these little little peewees and their mouths are yellow. They're just mush or mouths and she just opens her mouth and drops it in. So that's my first image. What's your second image? Open up wide, open up wide. Open well, they up. didn't have the Egyptian uh, foods that they were used to. They, they, they went, oh, I want to go back. I want those foods, you know, those specialty things. But this was open your mouth wide and manna came down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And filled them. Yeah, good. Yeah. You don't belly ache about what you're missing in Egypt. Open up now. You've been provided for miraculously. Okay, good. What's another image when you think of open up wide? Someone said it at the dentist chair or whatever. <laughs> I don't think that's exactly what this I will fill it up. Maybe fill a cavity, I guess. You could stretch the interpretation. That would be more than a stretch. So we had a contest here with the most grandchildren. So Kelly, how many did you have again? Six. Six. Nancy? Seven. Connie? Three. Miss Harlan? Four. Miss Jamie? Dude. <laughs> oh. If you've had kids, there's sometimes there's foods they don't like. <laughs> and you try to you try all kinds of techniques to have them open up their mouths. You know, you, you give a helicopter, you're an airplane, <laughs> <laughs> open up wide, you know. <laughs> you know, and they don't do it. And uh, you work hard at it. Uh, so your Lord said, Look, I've got plenty to give you, abundance, and uh, you just open up your mouth wide and I'll fill it. It's a neat little text here. But they didn't listen to that. They didn't, they didn't respond to the invitation. Verse 11, uh, verse 12, they gave them up to their own. So God said, look, okay, I'll just, if you, if you don't want me and want my ways, then I'll just turn you over to your ways. Go ahead. Live your life the way you want then. And uh, the Lord gives people up and up and then finally over to their sin. And that could be the worst, that's the worst punishment imaginable, being uh, turned over to your own sin and to self-destruction. So it's a very sad kind of picture here, uh, given in Psalm 81. Okay, any comments there, Psalm 81? Just for musical uh, kind of an inventory, who plays an instrument? What do you play? Uh, <coughs> a piano, and then I used to play a cello. Piano and cello. Kelly? Violin. Violin, it's a cello, violin. Daniel? No. <laughs> Slavic? No. <laughs> what do you play, Sarah? I play guitar. I played in a while. Okay, good. Guitar. Okay, yes. Okay. No. no. David? Uh, piano, uh, violin, and viola. And ukulele. Oh. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, violin, piano, viola. Viola. Good, good. I'm just trying to put together an orchestra. I tell you what, already, this is a lot of strings here, a lot of strings. Okay, yes? Just on um, piano and violin. And ukulele. I've seen you. <laughs> I, think that's a, I think that's the Hawaiian blood in you guys. You guys like that ukulele. Hannah, what do you play? <laughs> piano. Piano. What else? Percussion. Because <laughs> you've done that. Okay. Yeah, piano percussion. Percussion, what do you play? Uh, piano. Piano, wow. So a number of pianists, a lot of strings, a little bit of percussion. Yeah, I think we got it here. We really do. Everybody else can sing. Who can, <laughs> let's be honest, who cannot sing in the group? I Thank you. Sl oh, oh I can't sing. Slava can't sing. I think the funniest Barney Fife show I've ever seen. <laughs> And, and, have you ever seen the Andy Griffith show yeah, yeah. where Barney's in the choir and it's a total, he's a total <laughs> <laughs> you know, And then they kind of, they override him with this beautiful voice. 
He's very it's proud of his singing. Yeah, it's, it's a scream. It's a scream. Okay. <laughs> All right. Psalm 82. Let's go to there. Psalm 82 for a moment. <laughs> so this is the trickiest of the Psalms today to interpret. So it's really, really tricky. We're going to get to that in a moment. And the reason it's tricky are these phrases. Uh, verse 1. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. Verse 6, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Okay, So that passage we're going to have to come back to in just a moment. In Psalm 82, you guys need an answer for that very much. But uh, before we do that, let's go to the next Psalm, 83. So the Psalm 83, boy, oh boy, this these different you know genres for these psalms is just the range is incredible. You, know, you had the fall of Israel 586. Now you have a prophet prophetic psalm, and it's talking about a tribulation setting where Israel is going to absolutely uh, pay the price, and it tells you uh, a lot about this 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 gathering this group. Uh, so let's look at verse 2 for a moment. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. So when we talk about this prophecy of these pagan countries, these non-Jewish countries coming after Israel, uh, what's motivating them? They hate Israel. This, you know, motive is hate, 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 verse 2. Uh, the goal of this confederacy, confederacy is verse 4, and they have said, come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may, may be no more in remembrance. So, man, they're, they're, they hate this country, and their their end game, their goal is to cut Israel off as a nation. So that would mean Jerusalem not the capital, Israel not a nation, the Temple Mount no 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 access in any way to it, and just let's destroy this country so they'll never be be remembered. And deep into Israel over there, you can feel that tension all the way around. Everywhere, everywhere you look, north, south, you know, uh, east, bringing some ships from the west, they're just, everyone hates them. And um, depending on who's running the show over here in America, who's running the show in Israel, kind of kind of tempers uh, how bad or how good things will be over there. Most of the time, it's, it's very tense, very, very tense. Uh, we just had a, a, someone come back from Israel and they couldn't go to this place or this place or this place. It was just, just too much tension. Too much, too much tension. There's some good places and they're very, they're very careful, obviously. I know the way you may be going again soon, so I'm going to discourage it. But because it, their main industries is for both the Muslim and the Jew and the Christian is tourism. So they're, they try to insulate all that. But there are times where the Muslims and the Jews, they just are. And it's largely initiated by the Muslims. The man, they just, they just hate Israel. They hate Israel. So um, motive of hate, goal to destroy the nation. How to do it? It's a confederacy, verse 5. Uh, they're confederate against thee. And then it tells you the players, the countries that are involved. And all these are Muslim countries that are on the list here, whether it be Edom, uh, which would be modern-day Jordan, Jordan area. And the Ishmaelites, uh, the Ishmaelites are... Uh, the descendants of Muhammad. <laughs> uh, Muhammad is a descendant of the Ishmaelites, I should say, of Moab, again, Jordan, the Hagarines, Jebal, Ammon, Amalek, the Philistines, Tyre, Asher, and just on and on it describes the Midianites and so on. Uh, that whole region, it's just saying, we're going to come together. They don't get along, these countries. The only thing they have in common is a mutual hatred for Israel. So let's set aside our differences between whatever branch of Islam we are, and let's just gather and let's destroy Israel. Let's go after it. And this is this is there right now. It's, it's brewing. And in the tribulation, they're going to go after it. It will, it will be realized, at least in effort. So very interesting. Verse 12, um, you know, let us take to ourselves the houses of God in possession. So it's really ultimately about worship and who's, who's being worshipped and where. We get Israel out of there. So Psalm 83. Psalm 84. Um, this is really a beautiful song, longing to be in the house of God. Verse 2. My soul longs, yea, even faints for the courts of the Lord. So here's a, a, a worshiper, a follower of God who wants to be in the house of God. And um, 
he, he, he says in verse four, it's, blessed, it's a blessed condition to be there, to dwell in the house, to be worshiping together with other believers. You know, what we have here going today is really being described, uh, this kind of context of worship. And then a comparison is made in verse 10, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. And the idea is a thousand outside of the house of God, outside of the court. So one day is better than a thousand other days spent anywhere else. And then he says, I'd rather be a doorkeeper. Someone's talking about, you were talking about gatekeeper, but I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. So uh, he's saying, I'd rather have this lower position in the temple work than to be in a position of a, you know, a party crowd, an influential group, an affluent group. I'd rather have this position than the other where it involves sin. So a uh, beautiful psalm, wanting to be in the house of God and serve in some way. And uh, this is something for all of us, you know, come together. We have a place to worship. We have a family to worship with. And then to figure out what's our niche. Where do we fit in here? Or a body, what member, what part do we play? Where do we serve? In Psalm 80, 84. Okay. Any questions before we dive in into Psalm 82? That's huge. So Psalm 82. <clears throat> Let's talk about it for a moment. So he judges among the gods. That's word Elohim. Verse 6, I've said you're Elohim, you're gods. So what cults? love to take this psalm and misapply it. What are the cults? That I guess the Mormons. Mormons. This is the Mormons' number one proof text. Okay. So when you say to a Mormon friend, your neighbor, uh, we believe in, in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that they're co-equal, one God, three persons, the Trinity. And uh, when you really pin them down, they do not believe in the triunity, uh, the nature of God, one God, three persons. And their theology is that um, Jesus is a God, and he came to this earth. God the Father is his biological father. So God the Father has a body, and he had sex with Mary. And the result of that was baby Jesus. So the physical birth of Jesus was the father and Mary. That was the parents. And Jesus' soul was kind of held in a kind of a retainer, retaining tank. At the moment of conception, the soul was released from a pre-existing condition and joined now the physical that was created by the Father. So they they deny the virgin birth. This is, you know, God the Father didn't have sex with Mary. God the Father is spirit. He's not a body. And uh, we know the Holy Spirit is the one who supernaturally um, not had sex with Mary, but supernaturally and mysteriously uh, is responsible for the humanity of, of, of the Messiah. His deity is eternal, but he he got us when we become man. The Holy Spirit is the part of the, the part of that mix there. So they love to come to this passage because their theology is is Jesus became a god, and this is his planet, and he's going to come back, and he's going to have he's going to populate this earth. And he's going to have a harem of women, you know, have sex with them, and for a woman, your joy is to be eternally pregnant, always bearing kids. So you're gonna you're gonna repopulate <laughs> the man who's the god who's the god of that planet, and each of you men here, if you're a Mormon today and you're at a steakhouse, they your your motivation and it's a, they have a unified curriculum. So whatever's being taught in Utah, is the same message being taught in Nevada. Okay, it's the same message. So you as a man, you if you're a good Mormon, you eventually will be evolved spiritually to become a god, and you will have your own planet like Jesus had his. You're going to have your own planet, and you're going to have your harem of women, and you're going to have sex with them for eternity, and, and you're going to populate your, your planet with, with your women. Okay, that's, that's your future. That's your future. So it's a very sensual sexual religion. Um, and if you're, one of, if you're a Mormon wife or one of the wives, that man controls your eternal destiny. And when you get married, you get a pet name or a code name given to you by him. And that name he uses to bring you to his planet, to his heaven. If you're not a good wife, he won't call you up. You, you, you won't get called. 
So he controls your destiny. How do you like that? He controls your destiny. What if, what if the name is like something like Bertha? Or something? <laughs> <laughs> That's a terrible name. <laughs> we had a couple Berthas here. They were the Lord now. So I, I always like to use Bertha. So, oh, man, I'd offend her and her. There was two Berthas. Uh, so, I would name your kid Bertha, but whatever. So, uh, so they love this passage. Of course, it's quoted in John 10. We'll get to there in a moment. Okay. So let's just take a couple minutes and walk through the passage to understand what is being said. It is a very complicated psalm. So I'll just kind of introduce some of the uh, explanation. So notice the context, Psalm 82. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges. So it's speaking of God in the role of a judge among the Elohim, among the gods, among the gods. And what you're going to find out is that the term Elohim is the plural for gods, okay? So when God, the true God, Jesus, is called Elohim, it's in the plural. That means he's multiple gods. You have what's called a plural of majesty. So if you want to really magnify someone's person, you put it in the plural. You put it in the plural. It's called majesty, a plural of majesty. So you, you have Elohim, which is a great title for, for God. It's one of many. Yahweh would be another one, and Jehovah Jireh, and other, other names. But Elohim can also describe judges, someone in a position of authority representing God and uh, distributing judgment in, 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 in line with God in his word. So you're going to see the word Elohim has a little broader range in its definition. It can mean God himself, but also to mean those who are serving as judges in a position representing God, executing judgment through the word of God, <clears throat> acting as spokesman for God. So, how long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy, deliver the poor and needy, rid them out of the hand of the wicked. And so the whole topic here is what topic would you say, verses two and following? Judge, defend, deliver the innocent. What, what's the context? What, would, what word, one word would you say summarizes what's going on? Just for context, what word could you use? Going back to verse one, so the context would be a judge judging. Yes. So the context is judges, and then verse six, he God said, "You're gods, you're gods. Not you're not deity. You're not you're not like God Himself, but you are gods. You are judges. You are." To the people in position of authority because you've been given the word. And you are also children of mine, children of the most high. But he then gets back to the very humanity of these people. But when, when it comes to dying, you're going to die like men. <laughs> Your sin will lead you to a grave and fall like one of the princes. You will die. You're a man. And then the appeals made back to God. Arise, O oh God, and you judge the earth. So the idea is God is judging Man is doing a terrible job at time judging. They're doing it unjustly. They're doing it with partiality. They're doing it to, to you know, feed their wallet, not to help the poor. And uh, these people who should be good judges, who you are God's judges, they're not doing it. And at last appeal, God, you please come and judge because it's not getting done right. Okay? So it's kind of the psalm what's going on here. So let's go to John 10. And see how Jesus uses his psalm in, in his argument. And I took my notes right out of my, my John commentary. If you have that, you can look at it. So I'm going to start here in verse 30. And Jesus is speaking to a very broad audience here. There's a lot of uh, Jewish people, unsaved leaders. And in John 10, verse 30, he says, uh, My father, my 29, my father which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And the word one is in the neuter gender. So he is not saying masculine gender. Father and I are the same, identical. No, he's, he's saying there's a distinction between the Father and I, but we are one in mission. We're one in purpose. Uh, we're, we're unified in that when we save someone, you are kept by the, by the hand of the Father, anthropomorphism. You know, he doesn't have a hand, but you know, human language to help us understand he's going to protect us and keep us, and Jesus is going to keep us. 
like all state, you're in good hands, all right? With, with eternity, you're in really good hands, the Father and the Son, all right? So that's his argument that he's, he's saying we're functioning in oneness, functioning in sameness when it comes to securing the believer's salvation. You're in really good hands, almighty hands, okay? So what happens in verse 31, the Jews took up stones again to stone him. When he just says that, they get the message He's claiming not to be the father, but he's claiming to be equal to the father. This is the third time in John where he is claiming equality with God the father. He's claiming to be God. And they get it. And they're saying, you can't say that. You're not God. You are just a man and you're blaspheming. And so we're going to pick up stones and stone you as a blasphemer. Verse 32, Jesus answered them, many good works that I showed you for my father but which of those works do you stone me? You've watched what I've done. You, you know, what have I done wrong? And uh, and they're saying, it's not what, you, not what you did. It's what you just said, you know. Uh, it's not for the works that you did. You know, yeah, maybe you did a few good things, but we're going to stone you because of what you said, not because of what you do. They said, well, you, be consistent because what I'm doing, these miracles demonstrate that I am who I just claim to be. I'm God. These are authenticating miracles to confirm I'm deity, Okay. So the works in the speech you just gave, they go hand in hand, they're, they complement. So, but for blasphemy, verse 33, because that thou being a man makest thyself God, they got it. You're making yourself equal to God. Who, who do you think you are? And Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, you're gods. So this is where the Mormons, when you say Jesus is God and we, we, we knock out their their argument that we become gods, they're going to come as pastors to explain this to them. You're gods. So what does what argument is Jesus using here? What is he communicating? How do you interpret this? Is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. And if he called them gods, who's he referring to? If he called those individuals gods, those humans, those men, those judges, gods unto whom the word of god came so those men who he gave the title gods elohim if these mere men were given the word of god and they were called gods um and the scripture cannot be broken say ye of him referring to himself whom the father has sanctified and sent into the world thou blasphemest because i said i'm the son of god so what's the argument going on here how would you describe it in the in a in a debate, what argument is he using here? Thought. He's saying that you can call like the rulers of the earth gods. And why can't you call me the son of God when I like right in front of you I can manifest the works of God? Yeah, you're hitting it. So it's an argument from lesser than to greater. That would be the technical argument. Less going from less than to great. These are just mere men. They, were, they served as judges. They were given the word of God to, to exercise judgment through the word. And we called them Elohim. How much more so? I am God. They were just men serving it in the role of judge, judges, executing hopefully the word of God. I am the son of God. You know, and here are the works that prove it. Okay. So it's a tough argument. We need to come back to this if you'd like. It's a tough argument, what he's trying to say here. And when you know to have this psalm at the tip of your mouth and throw it back at them, pretty pretty impressive. So if you've not read my notes, I do have notes on this you know, six pages. If you want a little bit more explanation, so so it's a psalm that you got to be ready for if you're dealing with Mormons. Okay, well we need to pray. Lord, thank you for our time here together. Thank you for our class. Thank you for the new members class and for your word. And Lord, that you've given us a quite an opportunity and responsibility to be stewards of the word of God, to rightly divide it, to proclaim it, to live it. So Lord, help us be faithful in your testimonies for you. Bless in the morning service now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.